Hello from Newport Pagnell United Reformed Church. From wherever you're watching, and indeed whenever you're watching, you are very, very welcome. For the time being, we'll be bringing you worship from home, as we're unable to meet in our lovely church building due to current restrictions. So let us come together and worship God. God of God, light of light, true God of true God, we bless you. God of new beginnings, hope of hope, as we reach for this new year, we bless you. God of joy, God of delight, as we give thanks for all that is good, we bless you. Longing for light, we wait in darkness. Longing for truth, we turn to you. Make us your own, your holy people. Light for the world to see. Christ be our light. Shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Troubled, longing for hope, many despair. Your word alone has power to save us. Make us your living voice. Christ be our light. Shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Longing for food, many are hungry. Longing for water, many still thirst. Make us your bread, broken for others, shed until all. Longing for shelter, many are homeless. Longing for warmth, many are cold. Make us your building, sheltering others. Walls made of living stone. Christ be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Many the gifts, many the people, many the hearts that yearn to belong. Let us be servants to one another, making your kingdom come. Christ be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Church girl. 
This candlelight tells us God's light is here. The blessing of daylight, the blessing of sunlight, the blessing of Christ's light shining in our lives. We worship God, the giver of light. Amen. A prayer of thanksgiving. Lord of hope, we give you thanks for a new day. We arise today to a horizon guiding our eye beyond the everyday, to a dawn gently lighting up the wonders of your creation, to a whispered dew rooting us firmly to this precious earth. For this and more we thank you. Lord of hope, we give you thanks for a new year. We arise today to the knowledge that your Son, our Lord, goes before us, to the hope that through his presence all people will be transformed to the promise of salvation for all. For this and more we thank you. Lord of hope, we give you thanks for a new start. We arise today turning our backs on the ways of judgment and criticism, avoiding narrow-minded assumptions, reaching out to enemy and friend with generous, compassionate hearts. For the promise of a new start, a new year, a new day, for these gifts and for so much more, we thank you. Amen. A prayer of confession. God of life, you commanded us to be the caretaker of your creation. Instead, because of our self-centeredness, we have exploited and destroyed it. Lord, forgive us. God of justice, you commanded us to care for the life of your creatures. Instead, because of our greed, we accumulate resources for our own benefits and perpetuate the ecological depths in the world. Lord, forgive us. God, the bread of life, you commanded us to feed the hungry and gave us sufficient food for every creature. Instead, because of our gluttony, we forgot the needs of others, take more than we need and waste the food. Lord, forgive us. God of compassion, you commanded us to love each other as you love us. Instead, because of our love of profits, we foster unsustainable consumption and deny others the means to live the fullness of life. Lord, forgive us. God of love, you commanded us to forgive. Instead, because of our iniquities, we fail to forgive our enemies and redeem the depths of others. Lord, forgive us. God of peace, you commanded us to live in peace. Instead, because of our love of power, we control others, spread hatred, choose war. Lord, forgive us. Gracious God, hear our confessions, forgive and have mercy on us. Amen. This reading is taken from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the beginning, when God, these are the first words in our Old Testament. But these words are perhaps the most important of the ideas that confront us this morning. In the beginning, when God. God was there in the void, in the darkness. And God was there at the moment of creation. 
breathing life into the void and the darkness and creating life. God is at the heart of creation, just as God is at the heart of life. And yet, as I tried to reflect on this well-known reading, for some reason I couldn't find God. I couldn't detect that breath of God in the moment of creation. I couldn't feel that love of God that brings life. All I could feel was that sense of void and darkness, that suspicion of desolation in the wilderness where we will find John in our second reading, and a sense of disorder rather than a sense of a new creation. I struggled to find that God-inspired word, and yet it became clear that perhaps we need to start with the darkness, because that is the place where many of us find ourselves today in this world dominated by COVID-19. For many of us at this moment, it may be hard to experience the creative presence of God when our primary experience is of a world of limitation and restriction, of isolation and separation from human contact, of disease rather than health, of death rather than life. For many people at this difficult time, feelings of void and desolation are far more likely to dominate than any sense of a creative love that brings life. But we believe that in the beginning, when God. Strangely, though, that sense of desolation may be a good point from which to start our reflection. For this first creation story almost certainly derives from a world of daily suffering experienced by the exiles in Babylon, which is when many scholars now date the first creation story, written after the second story which contains the even better known story of Adam and Eve. Exile, as many people can still attest today, was inevitably destructive of faith, peace and hope, with its potential to disrupt and even destroy meaningful and creative relationships. But into this context, the creation story proposes an alternative reality, a reality over which the Babylonian Empire and the Babylonian gods have no control. For creation is through the work of Yahweh, breathing life into the void with light breaking through the darkness, creating day and night, but also bringing light into the dark world of exile. What the exiles had experienced was clearly not what Yahweh had intended in creation, but was the result of human and structural sin, the domination of one people by another. The creation story does not give us a scientific account of the origins of the cosmos, but it does remind us that things are not as they ought to be, for they are not as Yahweh created them. They tell us about the disorder of the world at the time of the exile and illustrate the disorder in our own world, contrasting the darkness and chaos we experience with the goodness of creation. Yahweh's creation brings order out of primal chaos, so that the exiles, although they cannot escape the burdens and restrictions of their daily lives, can at least live their lives according to a pattern designed by their God. Theirs was the God of all creation, the God who created day and night, land and sea. The God who created sun and moon, two of the gods worshipped by the Babylonians, and so preeminent over them. One God, the God who created a pattern for life, a pattern for worship, a God who created all things and rested on the Sabbath. This God, our God, is sovereign and powerful. God says, and it happens. 
God is the creator of all things. God is unconfined. The creation narrative offers us signs of an alternative world within the world, just as the kingdom of God provides an alternative focus for Jesus in his ministry. It is a world of goodness, a world that it is of God because it is a place of life, but for the exiles to live out that new reality meant renouncing the Babylonian view of the universe and embracing a new way. It meant taking a risk. It meant stepping out into the unknown. It meant facing the reality of creation, a world untamed and unpredictable, but a world of God. Strangely, if we look, look deeply enough, we will see different images of water in this passage. For in Genesis, the waters, the deep, is a place of chaos, until the breath of God sweeps across it, bringing new life from a place of death, and reminding us, as we face our own wilderness, that it is the transforming, life-giving presence of Yahweh that brings light and life to even the darkest of places. As we look outwards today, it is possible to see a world without God, a world filled with darkness and chaos, a world of dashed hopes and dreams, a world of sadness and sorrow, of death and grief. But in that darkness we can also see the light shine of people inspired by love reaching out to the stranger in our own community through the COVID-19 response team, of nurses sitting through the night holding the hand of the dying patient, of people from all faith traditions cooking meals for those who might otherwise go without, or the hundreds of thousands of people collecting food for the food banks in an attempt to ensure no one goes hungry. The breath of God bringing light to dark places and reminding us that when we look for God, we will find God's presence in those acts of faith and love shown towards neighbour and stranger. In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. God calls us, despite the chaos and darkness that can sometimes engulf us, to seek out that light. Amen. In grateful thanks for all that God has given us, we now offer this beautiful hymn, Take My Life. A reading from Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 to 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole of Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, 
with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you, I am well pleased. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For those of us who witnessed the potentially destructive powers of water during the recent floods in Newport Pagnell and the chaos it can cause, our focus today on water seems highly appropriate. Yet in these readings today, we are confronted with very different images of water. In Genesis, there is this basin of water over which the Spirit hovers a face brimming with promise and risk. In today's psalm, Psalm 29, we read of a God of storms, flames and mighty waters, of a God who thunders and causes the oaks to whirl and shakes the wilderness. In our other New Testament reading from Acts 19, St Paul baptises a group of Ephesian disciples causing their tongues to break loose into languages of prophecy through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And here in our Gospel reading from Mark, we hear that when John baptised Jesus in the waters of the Jordan, the heavens were torn apart, and the Spirit fell upon him in the form of a dove, and the voice of God filled the desert air. As we look again at this passage, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that we are being introduced to a dramatic and to some extent chaotic event. For most of us, far removed from the sort of organised and relatively calm experience of baptism or christening with which we are familiar in our churches. Unlike Matthew, who takes the best part of three chapters to get Jesus into the Jordan for his baptism, or Luke, 
or indeed John, who devotes the majority of his prologue to Jesus so that we know something about him when he appears on John's stage. Mark thrusts us straight into the story, leaving us with intriguing questions, but questions which are perhaps not pertinent to the story. I have often wondered about the relationship between Jesus and John, since they were supposed to be second cousins and their mothers seemed to be close at the time of their births. And yet it was unclear as to whether they were close or not. But maybe that doesn't matter. What was important, and as we learn from the first verses of Mark's Gospel, John is claiming that the story of salvation is restarting from the prophetic voice of God with, uh, and the prophetic voice of God will again be heard. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Mark's Gospel emphasises the point that John lived out his life in the wilderness, wearing camel hair and eating locusts and honey, a wild man in a wild place, proclaiming the word of the Lord, a man of God who did not conduct his ministry in Jerusalem and in the temple, alongside the respectable religious leaders of his time, but who lived on the margins of his society, away from the centre. According to the temple tradition, Jerusalem, and the temple in particular, is the centre of the world because it is the centre of Yahweh's presence and saving activities. But this is not where God has come in Jesus, for Jesus has come in the wilderness, as becomes apparent throughout Jesus' ministry. The temple is a centre of opposition to his message of the kingdom, and if we are to find God and God's kingdom, then we need to look instead to the margins and to the wilderness. What is perhaps surprising for those who want to draw people back into church is that John the baptizer drew crowds away from the centre, asking them to repent and receive baptism in the wilderness. And the crowds responded to his invitation. People from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to meet John at the Jordan River. For us, from our respectable 21st century vantage point, this is astonishing, but it is a movement that should have significance for us too. Jerusalem was the beating heart of Israel's spiritual life, and the temple was the place to go to meet God. And yet, something in John's message compelled large numbers of people to leave the centre of their religious lives, to find spiritual nourishment, rebirth and forgiveness elsewhere. There must have been something in John's message which drew people away, something fresh, something authentic, something that gave life, but a disruption nonetheless, a breaking down of an old way of life. And of course, this was very much the case for Jesus. For Jesus undergoes a baptism of repentance in the waters of the Jordan. Yet for him alone, it is his baptism into the kingdom of God, into his mission. Here in the Jordan, he publicly renounces his old life, old ties, old job, old priorities. His mission will require everything of him. And it begins with the renunciation of all that he has been, son, brother, carpenter, member of the Nazareth community. Suddenly, he is an itinerant preacher, prophet, miracle worker and servant of the king kingdom. And it is God, not John the Baptist, who announces him. Here at his baptism, the heavens are torn apart and for a moment we see into the mystery of heaven, for suddenly Jesus is set apart from the mass of humanity at the water's edge. Now we see the truth 
about Jesus, the meaning of his life and mission. It comes directly from heaven itself in the form of a dove, but only Jesus apparently hears the voice. In this moment, in his baptism, Jesus commits himself to living out an alternative reality, the way of the kingdom, God's way. This was a transformational moment for Jesus. But as we reflect on his baptism in the Jordan, in a wild place, it is difficult to ignore the importance of the wild places, the people and places on the margins. For it is often the case that the most compelling and daring calls for justice, truth, peacemaking and healing come to us, not from the heart of our institutions, including the church, but from the outside. Not from the official places, but from the marginal ones. Over the years, we have not seen countless centres in our cultural and political and religious lives lose their prophetic edges to complacency, corruption, stodginess or fear, including sadly some of our best known charities, and of course the church itself. And at the same time, have we not heard new voices speaking to us from wild and unexpected places, calling us to repentance and renewal, the discarded and disregarded, if we just have the will to listen, may have something significant to say. This is one of the great challenges and opportunities our work with the Mead Centre should present over the coming years, as we engage and build relationships and hear the stories of people so often considered to be on the margins. Through this engagement, we should experience the working of God. Through these relationships, our lives should be changed, just as the lives of the people at the Jordan and the disciples in Ephesus baptised by Paul were changed. If our own baptism means anything, then we too should be prepared to change through our encounters with Christ. As Debbie Thomas, an American pastor, explains, Jesus was baptised in a wild place, far away from the safe, the routine and the, and the familiar. If we want to follow him in our own baptisms, we too need to listen to voices crying out in the desert. We too need to leave the cities that make up our comfort zones. We too need to allow a good but wild God, to disrupt us. So how then should these readings this morning impact on our lives, and in particular at the start of a new year still dominated by Covid? So it is fitting that both the readings today resonate with beginnings, especially as we too find ourselves on the threshold of a new year, this year in particular, as we approach a new stage in our very existence globally, in how we are tackling the ravages of coronavirus and now in a third lockdown. Approval and rollout programmes of vaccines feature high in how we can move forward. But do we want just to return to an old normality? Or could this be the point in our lives where we learn from this disruption and this break with the past and start to live our lives differently? We have had plenty of time over the past year to reflect and ponder. We have, to some extent, been through a wilderness experience, and we can all probably identify ways in which perhaps we could change, start afresh, and take something positive into this new year. From the Genesis reading, we can marvel at the creation not just the creation of the wonderful world around us, but the creation of you and me, down to the very number of hairs on our heads. How amazing is that? God took that which was without form and empty and gave it both form and substance. In Mark we read about John the Baptist and Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan. John says, I baptise you with water but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. Again, this relates to a new beginning, and although many of us cannot recall our own baptisms, 
we have been able to support many others who have been brought to baptism over the years. Those powerful images of water that gives life, but which can be dangerous and a place of chaos, combined with the Holy Spirit, with the power to fill us to the brim if we are open to her promptings, can be an inspiration. For through our baptism, like Jesus, we have the opportunity, should we choose to take it, to commence a new life in Christ, with Christ. It is not an easy path, as it may take us into dark places, but it is a path that will lead us to life. Amen. Prayer of Intercession Let us pray. We hold in God's light all across the world who yearn for deep peace and unity, and in particular those countries where there is civil unrest and division, for the United States, for Hong Kong and China, and for many parts of the Middle East, and in particular Yemen. We hold in God's light all who live with anxiety, fear, dread or despair across our globe, for those who are struggling with physical and mental illness, particularly those affected by the COVID pandemic. And as we think of those who are sick, let us remember all those in the caring profession who show such commitment, care and love, and all other key workers whose selfless devotion has kept the country functioning during this pandemic. We hold in God's light this one fragile planet which we inhabit and ask for forgiveness for our contribution to the damaging effects of global warming on the climate and on your created world. In this year of COP26, we pray for all those who work for creation justice. We pray for justice for the poor and the persecuted, for refugees and all those forced from their homes through fear of violence, discrimination and abuse. And we pray that the Prince of Peace may remind us that our task is to be his hands and hearts on this earth. Amen. Please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
the blessing. Now let us go in peace. May this day, this year, unfold as it should. May we find solace in scripture and spirit. And may our journey into this new year be filled with the hope and promise of God, for the sake and the peace of the world. Amen.